Yeah. All right, enough of this frivolity. Uh, we are have a, uh, what time is it? 4.25 uh, work session today, uh, our annual work session that we have uh, McLadry here to tell us what we did right and what, hopefully nothing that we did wrong. But anyway, Michelle, go ahead. Lead us off, would you please? Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. We need a roll call. Madam Clerk, please. Yes, Ms. Cole? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Schmidt? Here. Mr. Lind? Mr. Schmidt? Mr. Morrissey? Here. Mr. Welper? Here. Mr. Hart? Check it. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Matt, now, Michelle, please. Okay. Um, Kevin Smith, who is our audit partner from McGladry, now called RSM. You'll notice all the reports will say RSM on them, but it's really this, well, the same firm as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> so. Um, we were we had to work hard to get the audit to you today, so we do not have printed copies. Um, we did get them electronically this afternoon, and I think everything is posted to the iPads. I, I want to thank Kevin and his audit team. They put in a lot of work in a short order to get this for us. I also always like to thank particularly my staff, Joyce Schrader, Emily Graham, Brent Boland. Um, Ruth Haley retired last year, and we had a hole in our team for a while and so we had it was hard for us to overcome that and get everything done that the auditors needed when they needed it but we all worked hard to get that to you and the departments also have a role in that because we're constantly asking them for information and needing them to turn things around to us so I always like to thank them too for getting things to us because we we need their help to get everything done and I think with that I will just turn it over to Kevin the presentation that Kevin's going to be talking through should be on your iPads. I think it's titled Presentation I, um, that kind of summarizes the high points of the audited financials, so you might want to follow along with that. And I also gave you a hard copy at your places if you prefer to follow with hard copy. Good evening. Um, Thanks for having me here tonight. As, as Michelle mentioned, you do have a, a copy of the presentation, looks like this, that, that I'll be talking through tonight that summarizes the results of the audit. Um, feel free to interrupt me if you've got questions, you want me to go into more detail, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. RSM, what is RSM, the acronym again? So, yeah, so McGladry, same firm, we rebranded into um, a new name that that's more internationally known. So RSM are the three firm. M is McLadry in RSM. The other two, the R and the S, are um, a French firm and a, a firm from, from Britain. And I would mispronounce the name of at least one of those firms if I, if I, if I tried to say it right now. But in October, we, we changed from McLadry to RSM. So that's what we're known as now. Name you can't pronounce. I like it. <laughs> So in the, uh, the presentation on, on slide one, first we'll go through um, some, some financial results at a very high level. Uh, Michelle mentioned the comprehensive annual financial report. All 170 pages of that is, is available electronically, um, but we just took a, a, few, a few numbers from that and provided some graphs and some charts in this presentation, um, but kept it at a, a pretty high level. And then we'll also talk through results of our um, compliance audit. The, the next slide there talks about the summary of the audit process. So the, the main points of the, um, of the audit, which is the city is required to have every year by uh, state and federal, federal guidelines. Um, the, main, the main purpose is to give an uh, opinion on the financial statements and whether they're in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. And the second part of our audit focuses on compliance with grants and also some, some state compliance type issues. So um, those are the two, the, two t the two key components of our audit. And um, we'll go through the results of, of both of those as we go through the presentation. But we'll start by, and I apologize, these slides are not numbered, but the, the first slide with the numbers on it, the revenue from all of your governmental funds. So this is a summary of the city's um, governmental funds for this the fiscal year ending June 30, 2015. These are reported on a modified accrual basis of accounting, so this is not a cash basis report. This is the, um, the basis that the CAFR is reported on for the, for the governmental funds. 
So you'll see overall revenue increased from um, 100 million to about 106 million from 2014 to 2015. So about a 6% uh, increase in revenues of, of all of the governmental funds. The biggest change you see is with the intergovernmental revenue. Um, so depending on timing of certain federal grants, there, there was about a $3.5 million increase in federal grant money this past year, which caused the majority of that intergovernmental uh, revenue line item to increase. Which as a result of that, if you flip the page and look at the expenditures, you also see that there was a, an increase in expenditures as well of about $6.2 million, um, which is about a 5.5% increase in expenditures. So, um, you know, as uh, that revenue went up, a lot of those, those costs were capital costs that were reimbursed by federal grant programs. The next slide shows the general fund fund balance as of June 30th, 2015. Um, so total general fund fund balance was uh, $24.5 million. And there's different components of the fund balance that are reported in the cap are based on the um, level of, of, of spending constraints that, that are um, associated with the fund balance. So about 37% <coughs> of the fund balance is restricted, which cannot be spent on um, other purposes for which, for which they're restricted for. And a good chunk of that is um, restrictions over the health insurance. About $7.3 million is restricted um, for the city's health insurance. And then you'll see 42% is unassigned um, and 20% is assigned. And if you look at the cap on page 70, it will give a breakdown of the different purpose restrictions for which the fund balance is restricted for or for which it's assigned. And that's note 20 in the financial statements on page 70. And the next slide shows the general fund um, history of revenue and expenditures and fund balance for the general fund for the past five years. <coughs> so there was a, an increase in overall fund balance of the general fund by about $794,000. And you'll also see the, the slight increase in revenue, increase in expenditures, um, and the fund balance is just under $25 million at the end of June. And if you look at that in comparison to um, on the next slide, if we, we look at the unrestricted fund balance in days for the general fund. Basically, taking that unrestricted fund balance divided by the expenditures of your general fund, and you multiply that by 365 days to say what would, if you stopped receiving revenue, um, you know, how many days could the city survive without generating any further revenue? And the recommended um, number of days that the GFOA gives is a range of about 90 to 120 days, so at least three months. And you'll see that the city is right within, right within that recommended range. Um, slight decrease from 2014, but still uh, within that 90 to 120 day range. And the next slide shows the enterprise funds. Um, so the sewer, sanitation, um, again, all of the, the categories, operating revenue, um, operating expenses, and the changes in that position are, are positive. Um, what you don't want to see is your enterprise funds operating at a deficit because the purpose of the enterprise is to be self-supporting. Um, so you don't see any negative uh, net income there with your, with your um, enterprise funds, which is always a good thing. And then flipping to this slide that's uh, titled Internal Control and Compliance Reporting. So in the, in the back of the CAFR, um, the compliance section starts on page 134 of the CAFR. And you'll see a, a letter in there from, from RSM that we, over internal control over financial reporting. Um, and that letter would include references to any sort of significant deficiencies or material weaknesses over financial reporting. Um, and there were um, none of those reported. There were a few items, immaterial instances of noncompliance with state statutes that, that are very similar to findings you've seen in the prior years. 
Um, the state just requires to report any deficit fund balances that are reported in any of the city's funds. And I believe there were four funds at the end of 2015. The grants, CDBG, the aviation, capital projects had deficit fund balances. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is noted in the report. <coughs> and the airport cash deficit um, finding is also something that has been reported in the past, but the city's, there's an ordinance that requires positive cash balance of the aviation fund, but that has not been achieved um, this year, and that, that has also been reported in prior years. One of the other letters that you see in some of the deliverables from, from RSM is uh, a reporting over PFC compliance. Um, the Federal Avi Aviation Authority has certain uh, procedures and testing that we are to do on the, on the PFC revenue that are generated by the airport, um, and there were no findings to report over that test work. And then the single audit is the audit over federal grant programs. Um, there's certain programs that we test each year on a, on a rotating basis, so we don't look at every single program every year. Um, and this year we tested the Community Development Block Grant uh, program, and there were no findings to report over, over the CDBG. And um, <coughs> so there was a, an unmodified or clean opinion that was given on, on that program. And also there were no instances of noncompliance that were reported over the single audit. And flipping the page to the next slide, this is auditor, auditor communication with city officials. This summarizes the, there's a separate uh, letter that's included within, within your materials that, that walks through some of the required communications that were to make to you at the end of the audit. Um, one thing you see mentioned is the, the clean opinion that the city received. So uh, over the financial statements I mentioned earlier, the, the purpose of the audit is to give a, uh, opinion on, on whether they're fairly stated in accordance with GAAP, and they were, so that you did receive a clean opinion on the financial statements. It also talks about significant accounting estimates that are included in the CAFR, and those are things that um, we incorporate into our audit procedure to make sure we test those, anything that's considered to be a significant estimate, and um, there were no issues with, with anything that, that we came across um, relating to those. There were a few adjustments that were that were um, proposed as a part of the audit process. You'll see a listing of those in that letter as well. Several of them just had to relate to timing of year-end um, accounts payable cutoff. No disagreements with management. Um, there's an item in there that talks about significant issues that were discussed with management. And one, one significant change that you'll see in the CAFR this year is the um, implementation of a new GASBY standards uh, over pensions. And it's something that you may have heard about in the past, um, but this is the year that the city was required to implement GASBY 68 um, and GASBY 71. And not just the city, but all governmental entities um, throughout the country that participate in um, defined benefit pension plans. And for the city, it, w it was impacted by IPERS and their participation in the municipal fire and police plan of Iowa. And what those new standards do, um, you know, it, it is important to point out that these standards don't impact how these plans are funded. Um, it's, it's really an accounting standard. And so what this, the new standard <coughs> says is that you've got employees that are working for the city right now or that have previously worked for the city that are earning these benefits that will be paid over time. So right now, you've got a liability um, that, that, that is associated with the city that will be um, paid out in the future one, to, to these employees when they retire. And so even though these, these plans are both state-sponsored plans, um, what, what these new standards require is that each governmental entity that participates in the pension plan reports its proportionate share of the unfunded pension liability that exists. So every, every entity that participates in IPERS is, asso is assigned a percentage um, based on their contributions to the plan. And then whatever is determined to be that unfunded liability is then passed down to each local government and that liability shows up in your financial statements. And so this year when you look at those consolidated government-wide financial statements, you'll see um, about a $34 million liability that is being reported this year for the first time. Um, about just under $10 million of that is associated with IPERS, 
and about $26 million of that is associated with the police and fire plan. And there's several pages, probably about 10 pages of no disclosures that are also reported now about, about those two plans that you'll, see, <coughs> that you'll see in the financial statements for the first time. So again, this is something that is, is it's not specific to Iowa. These are, these are new standards that are impacting all governmental entities um, across the country, but it is um, the, the biggest change that you'll see in, the, in this year's financial statements. But no, um, no, no significant issues came up during the audit. We received full cooperation from, from everyone we worked uh, with all the departments that, that we um, dealt with as a part of the audit process. So we want to thank them for that. And I'd be happy to answer any questions that, that you have at this time. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, good, as always. Council? I can't find the electronic version. I'm not sure where it's at, but I've not been able to. Well, while he does that, let me ask you a question on the revenue slide. Uh, Interfund no. charges for services. That looks new for 2015. Gotcha. We have had those before. Um, that's mostly for things from the garage for fuel and parts. I think there may be a little bit different in presentation in what's on this slide from 14 to 15. Okay, so no, nothing really new, just different presentation. Correct. Okay. That's right. Further? Mr. Schmidt, did you find it? Or did, did Susie you? find it? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, on the general fund, I guess the, the question I have, Michelle, is on the uh, significant difference between the expense and the revenue for. 15, can you talk about that a little bit? From 14 to 15? I mean, the revenue is, is up slightly, and, and the expenditures up, look like they're up about $5 million. And I apologize, I didn't see this on the electronic version, but I, I think I'm this is for all the governmental funds, mm -hmm. and primarily that will be for capital projects that are reimbursed by grants, or sometimes we, we often sell the bonds in one year, we record that revenue in the year the bonds are sold. We don't spend that bond money until later years. So they, a lot of times the revenue and expenditures get out of sync. So when you see the expenditures exceeding revenue, it's because we're spending down funds that need to be spent down. Basically, they're, they were done for a specific purpose and need to be spent. So it, that's not related to the general fund itself. The general fund itself had about a $40,000 increase in unrestricted or what we call unassigned fund balance. Um, the restricted, I think, also grew, if I remember correctly. Um, so we, we came about as close to having no change in general fund unassigned balance as I would ever like to see us get. But Thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, and, and Michelle, thank you. Uh, good work, as always. And Kevin, we appreciate your firm's uh, helping us out. You've been with us for a long time. So thank you. Thank you. Just take one and pass it down, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, as soon as council uh, gets if you have um, all of the uh, uh, handouts that Ms. Shares just gave, uh, uh, this um, it's the same as what's online too. Okay, this this item, this issue is being brought by uh, council members. It's not necessarily my initiative, although I do agree with it. Uh, issues of confidentiality have become uh, issues, uh, quite honestly, uh, as of late and particularly when we are talking in, in uh, uh, terms of economic development issues and we have uh, meetings with Noel who briefs us on things or, or even more specifically when we have uh, uh, executive sessions, those executive sessions are, are there for a reason. There's a reason we don't uh, participate in those conversations in, in open councils. The legislature gives us the opportunity, the ability to have executive sessions if they're held uh, under proper terms, we always ask our legal counsel whether or not 
uh, we are going to executive session under proper authority. Uh, so far, he's always said that we are. Uh, and we expect those conversations that we have in those executive sessions to be treated somewhat like uh, grand jury proceedings, that the information that's shared in those are to be kept confidential. And there's a reason for that. And quite honestly, it makes it very difficult for staff to do business when we uh, uh, can't be sure that uh, the information that is uh, brought up in executive session stays in executive session. So, uh, having said all of that, a uh, little soapbox, uh, I, I will turn it over to any council person that would like to explain this, but there was a feeling amongst council members that there should be some uh, 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 liability, uh, for lack of a better word, for council members that, that violate that, uh, that sanctity of uh, uh, confidentiality and uh, it is a council action. Uh, the, the state doesn't uh, doesn't uh, give us the uh, any opportunity for <coughs> penalties. Although the state gives the council the opportunity to apply their own penalties, to come up with their own uh, sanctions. Uh, so I believe, Mr. Morrissey, you were the one that worked with Mr. Zellifer to craft this. So I would like to turn this over to you. This was uh, uh, Councilman Morrissey wanted this on today's agenda to be voted on and. Uh, uh, keeping in with my policy that I don't like to do that, put things particularly like this on the agenda without some conversation, I pulled it off of the agenda for a vote uh, and did uh, put it on for a work session so that we could have conversation about it. Mr. Morrissey. Uh, thanks, <coughs> Mayor. Um, <clears throat> although I'm the newest one on the City Council that's sitting here right now, the uh, times that I've been in executive session, there have been occasions when I've asked um, uh, what is the consequence, are there any consequences if um, this confidentiality or this privacy, the executive session, or the reasons for going into exession, executive session, if those were in any way felt to be violated. And uh, so at that point in time, I talked to um, uh, you and I also would talk to uh, City Attorney Zellifer and um, I looked up some stuff uh, from various cities uh, looked up state code, uh, went to the League of Cities and down there talked to a couple of attorneys uh, down there, uh, talked to Susie Shares and got some, some information from her uh, about uh, wording and stuff like that. And to me, it, it really didn't make any sense that we have um, a, a code of conduct that is set for us as city council people, uh, an expectation on us but if we don't follow that, there's no consequence. That makes no sense to me. And so uh, putting together all the different things, um, and I appreciate the conversations I had with other people, um, I uh, uh, prepared some language, and then I gave that to uh, uh, City Attorney Zellifer, and uh, he then fine-tuned and uh, made this a little bit more acceptable legally, I believe. Uh, and uh, so we came up with this. Um, and uh, I, I don't know if you want to go through this in total, but <clears throat> I will. I'll read it. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. You, to. <laughs> you can paraphrase so people can get into okay, it. Okay. Okay. Basically, what it's it, it it says is that the when we go into executive session, we're expected to keep what's said in there in there and not to talk to anybody else other than the people that were in that room. Uh, about what was said and for the reasons that the mayor has spoken um, it, it shows the significance and the importance of sticking to that and um, so because of that uh, as an example I didn't even know this until looking this up if you're going there and you're going to take some notes those notes have to be turned in at the end of that and you can't have any recording devices or anything like that those have to be uh, turned in um, from the, the executive session. Um, no emails can be sent out to anybody, social media, any written notes or anything like that to anybody who's not in, has not been in that executive session. Um, so uh, that includes city employees, except the, the difference with city employees as opposed to council people is that city employees may have to be working on some of those issues like with economic development. Therefore, they are expected to go outside that uh, as opposed to uh, uh, city council uh, people. Um, so uh, having uh, heard from different people about what 
she felt to be a consequence of mm -hmm. this, we came up with uh, uh, two ideas, or one basic idea with two uh, consequences. And uh, that last uh, paragraph, which includes A and B, uh, basically um, uh, talks about if there is some kind of accusation uh, by somebody, I mean, this is not to be a scurrilous uh, kind of accusation. There's to be some uh, substance to it. Um, that goes either to the mayor, mayor pro tem, or the city clerk uh, to look at that to see if it meets that muster, if there is uh, uh, something that needs to result in a special meeting uh, between the city council and the city attorney uh, to have that special meeting to discuss what had happened, any information uh, or the information that points to a violation, and then the full council, uh, given the information, uh, with the accused uh, council person uh, being given every chance in the world to, to say what, uh, what they believe the situation is, then the, the council, other than the person accused, has to take a, a vote on that. And if the vote uh, affirms the accusation that there was a violation of the confidentiality requirement of executive session, then a first offense results in a censure which is a formal public condemnation of the council member's violation of the executive or uh, closed session rules. <clears throat> and then the second offense, if one would occur, results in expulsion or complete removal of that council member from any further closed or executive sessions. And um, the duration of that expulsion would be set by city council and limited or extended by considering the severity of the violation. Okay. So that. <clears throat> Thank you, Pat. And, and your, I think your intent is to have this on the uh, council agenda for our January 11th to, yes, to have a vote. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Okay, so, council, that is uh, the yeah, And the I might intent. add, I, I didn't, I couldn't, I don't know if Bruce Jacobs is here because I called him, but I never got a call back. But okay. uh, I know I talked to Jerome, and Jerome is here, and I said that we'd be having this session. So that he could be here. Okay. Mr. Zellifer, do you have anything that, that, that uh, even if you don't, could you just add the the uh, the, the leg legality of this or the, if your research, what you have discovered and so forth, just to lend some credence to the fact that we can do what we're doing? Sure. Or that uh, you can do what you're doing. Dave Zellifer, city attorney there. This is not against the law if a council member uh, wants to leave executive session and go out and have a press conference and announce what was in there. It's There's nothing illegal against it like criminal. Uh, but the, the spirit of the ex executive session is uh, the best inter interest of the city is at heart here and it, money or personnel or uh, litigation, any of those things that need to be private until they're resolved need to remain private. So I was approached by Mr. Morrissey and uh, he actually, more the, I'm not taking credit for this, the vast majority of the language in that is from him. Uh, this is allowed under the Iowa Code. Uh, and I've, I've, I've spoken to a number of attorneys throughout the state who, uh, city attorneys that is, uh, who suffer the same problems we do, and they're all pulling their hair out too, and there aren't very many of these uh, resolutions out there, but uh, there are people who would like them. So it's necessary, I think, and I think this is the first step in getting it resolved. Thanks, David. Okay, Council, uh, you have a copy of the proposed uh, executive session policy and punishment for violation. Uh, are there comments that you'd like to address now? Ms. Cole. I won't be here to vote in January. However, I do support this. It concerns me greatly. Until the last couple of years, this hasn't been a problem. When I became on council, I was under the mistaken impression that speaking outside that room was a $500 fine or a $1,000 fine, and I was amazed to discover there's no penalty. But when I am reading in the Courier blogs the details of lawsuits that are being filed against the city, and as we all know, everybody sues cities for every single thing. Um, it puts, I mean, if you look at it from a taxpayer standpoint, and shockingly enough, every one of us up here pays taxes, um, 
we don't need to be giving a, the attorneys we don't need to be showing them our hand we don't need to let them to know what our strategy is because every time something like that happens we could risk a settlement we could risk paying more money um, there are just a number of occasions that that the, we, the violations have occurred and truly there's I mean it's it destroys the integrity of the council if we can't trust the people that are sitting next to us so I hope that you can find four votes in January to pass this. Thanks, Carolyn. Anybody else at this time? Anywhere? Mr. Welker. Um, I have no problem with establishing a policy. Uh, here again, I've been doing this for 14 years, and I have enough self-discipline that I can keep my mouth shut <laughs> until the proper time mm -hmm. when it can be made public. So I, I have no problem with establishing a policy such as this. Okay. Anybody else now? Mr. Smith? Mr. Vargas, I... I was going to ask, you know, what the purpose of this is. So I don't know if the purpose of this is because people have seen comments on the blog. I mean, I guess I'd like to just know where this really kind of came from. From my what the purpose my, of it. From is. my standpoint, and I probably should yield to Mr. Morrissey, but I, from from my standpoint, because I, it may affect me more directly than it does council members at times, Mr. Schmidt. As we've already established, executive sessions are closed sessions. Uh, the material that's uh, discussed in there can range from uh, uh, legal issues to personnel issues to economic development issues, and they're, they're discussed under an executive session for a reason. And uh, we have had uh, very uh, definite instances uh, as of late of those, uh, those discussions being discussed outside of the executive session. And I think the only thing that this is doing, and I don't want I will let Mr. Morrissey speak, but from my standpoint, what this policy is establishing is that uh, executive session material is confidential and it matters that it stays confidential and if it doesn't stay confidential and can be proven for lack of a better word then there will be consequences for that thank you and uh, the reason why I uh, went into this Steve was um, uh, at one of the executive sessions, um, first of all, I don't, I'm not a social media person, so I don't read all that kind of stuff like that. Um, but uh, when I was in one of the executive sessions here during the, this year, and it was some, I think it was probably during the summertime, uh, I had asked uh, the mayor at that point in time what the consequence is of if somebody goes out, because I've been hearing this. If somebody leaves an executive session and talks about it, and um, the mayor said, uh, there are none, and I just found that unbelievable. I mean, if we are to consider <coughs> ourselves a, a, an important body, governmental body, making important decisions for the citizens, and we have a standard of conduct that we're to be held to, but there's no consequence for that, which is what I found out through the research, talking to the various people and that, I found that just absolutely abysmal, and that's when I decided at that point in time that I would follow through making more contacts and getting this before council, Steve. That's what happened. And, and again, I don't have any issue with this. I just, I, I'd really like to know, you know, kind of where it came from. If it came from Pat, if Mr. Came Moore was saying it came from you, Mr. No, Mayor, it came from me, Steve. No, it didn't oh, okay. come from me. Okay, I thought, that's, I thought you no. just made some reference. No. Okay. No, I, no um, I said I have to deal with the consequences of it more okay. probably than you do. But uh, no, it didn't come from me. And so just for the record, who actually wrote this document? I did. You did. For the okay. most part, Dave fine tuned it and put it so that it you know, okay. legally was uh, acceptable. And I'm also wondering too, you know, typically at a, a executive session, there are more than just the council members there. And mm -hmm. I see this only addresses the council members. So mm -hmm. how do we intend to deal with that? Well, as a council document, I could only address this as far as the council is concerned. If there's other things that has to do with city staff, and that I'm sure that, that is handled, and Susie could better answer that by disciplinary measures and you know a, a standard of conduct for those that are in that room. Uh, that includes, uh, um, I guess, anybody uh, that is in there, except in the course of doing their fulfilling the function of their jobs, uh, which is one of the exceptions to this team. So, yes, absolutely. There, any employee could be disciplined for violating confidentiality. Okay. All right. Thank you. Further? 
So, uh, Council, I, you know, as, as I, I try to do, I mean, this, this will be on the agenda on January the 11th uh, for discussion and for a vote. So if you have questions or heartburn or you're all for it, whatever, if, if you would discuss that prior to that time, I think that would be fabulous. With no further questions. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion is carried. We're adjourned. Thank you. The uh, boards and commissions meeting to order. Madam Secretary, if you read the roll, please. Yes, Mr. Schmidt. Here. Mr. Hart. Here. Mr. Jones. Here. Motion to approve the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second for the agenda. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. We have an agenda for you gentlemen that like to take a few of those items. Well, let me get to it. Uh, I can start. Um, so in one, we have a motion to receive and file Mayor Clark's recommendation for the following appointments. I'll take the first couple. Uh, the first is Don Tickner for, for Memorial Hall Commission with an expiration date of 1231-18. Marcia Corbett for Memorial Hall Commission with an expiration date of 1231-18. Richard Hastings, uh, again, Memorial Hall for expiration date of 1231-2018. Ron McCon McHone, Memorial Hall for 1231-18, and Sherman Lundy for Memorial Hall with an expiration of 1231-18. Doing an excellent job. Keep rolling. <laughs> okay. Marissa Van Dorn for Cultural and Arts with an expiration of 1231-18. Eric uh, Donut. Donut for Human Rights Commission. The expiration of 1 1 2019 and Cheryl Ferry's Human Rights Commission expiration 1 1 2019. Second. We have a motion to second on those items. Any uh, questions, comments, concerns? Seeing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those items are passed. Motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion to second to adjourn. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, we are adjourned. Thank you, gentlemen. Point that out too, if you would. Let's call the Finance Committee meeting to order. Madam Clerk, would you please read the roll? Yes, Ms. Cole. Here. Mr. Schmidt. Here. Mr. Jones. Here. Motion to approve the agenda and also the minutes of December 14th as proposed. Second. We have a motion and a second. Discussion on any of that? All in favor, vote by the sign of aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those items pass and we move to new business. Madam Chairperson, I'll take those first few items. First, Thank we you. have Garrett Gingrich and Nick Anderson, paramedics, for the 48 hour EMS paramedic refresher course, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, February 26th through the 28th at an amount not to exceed $598. 
Next, we have Dennis Gentz, Assistant City Engineer for the 52nd Annual Concrete Paving Workshop in Altoona, Iowa, January 27th through the 29th, an amount not to exceed $445. Item number three is Cheryl Huddleston, Human Resources Manager for the National Public Employer Labor Relations Association Annual Conference in Memphis, Tennessee, April 17th through the 21st an amount not to exceed $1,979.28. Next, we have Sean Page, Curator for the Haitian Art Society 2016 Annual Conference, San Francisco, California, February 10th through the 15th, an amount not to exceed $1,660. Next, we have Kent Shankle, uh, Director of Culture and Arts Commission for the Guatemalan Folk Art Collection Exhibition Research in Guatemala City, Guatemala, uh, February 10th through the 24th, amount not to exceed $1,605. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have discussion? Nope. Um, Chairperson, could I just? Yes, you may. Okay. Uh, with um, uh, number two, and I talked to Dennis Gibbs about this, but I just, uh, is there any way at that conference, um, uh, Eric, that uh, Dennis would be able to find out and bring back to us some reports on Korean concrete as well as perme permeable paving? If that's good, if that workshop would include this, um, Eric Thorsey, yes, he's uh, going to contact the folks concrete who put on that conference. Yeah. We're not sure those are the exact topics that are covered, that's but they do have problem. resources there, so he's going to do some checking on that, and we'll get and back and to us. And bring that back to us. Yes, Eric. Okay, thanks. Okay. Okay, and if I could just um, ask Kent a question. Um, we have these trips, and they're not to Denver, Iowa. So are these funded by grants or um, friends of the Center for the Arts? Uh, Kent Schenkel, Cultural and Arts Director. Um, yes, for these trips, we are not using city funds or state funds. Um, we have uh, uh, set aside some money in the Friends of the Arts Center budget to uh, support travel on an annual basis at this point. And then there are additional funds available from grants from the Community Foundation. Thank you so much. And, and also, if we could, just for the record, Kent, both you and Sean, when you're gone for those three weeks, you will be on city time, won't you? I will be taking vacation. Sean will be on city time. Gotcha. Thank you. Anything else, guys? Nope. All in favor, vote by the sign of aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Those items pass, and we move to the pre-auths. Okay, pre-auths. We have building and maintenance, $4,800 for the installation of 316 light fixtures at the West 5th Street parking ramp. City Clerk, $1,860 for public web access to resolutions, ordinances, and minutes, and human resource job applications workflow via Laserfish software. Clerk's office estimated at $3,151.76 for annual contract base rate charge for Laserfish uh, for the period of 12-19-2015 through 12-17-2016. Leisure services, $3,850 for renewal of annual subscription to TreeKeeper software. That's TreeKeeper Mobile and TreeKeeper 7.7. .7. Leisure services, $3,000. $520.10 for emergency repairs to Young Arena Ice System. Leisure services, $9,243.20 for four, uh, four foot LED tube lights. Police, $3,970 for annual renewal of IBM PH7233 AC1 hardware on site maintenance for servers. Police, $1,425 plus $18.05 shipping for 15P71 slash 72, sorry, 15P7100 slash 7200 portable batteries for portable police radios. And sewer department, $4,665 plus $200 shipping for hand, hole, cover, and wear ring for number two 
Easton RAS pump. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? I had a quick yes, question sir. on the uh, tree keeper software. And and I don't know if this, does this have to do with the whole ash, emerald ash bore situation or is this something completely different? Paul Heading, Leisure Services Director. Indirectly, um, <clears throat> the ash tree, emerald ash bore infestation was the driver for creating the tree inventory because we knew it would be critical to be able to uh, manage our tree resources as we're removing a lot of trees. So yeah, kind of indirectly, that's what, what spurred the purchase. Can you tell me where that whole process is at as far as the ash trees? We've removed to date about 1,100 ash trees. We have about 3,500 trees still to remove. We've removed, uh, you on council have approved stump removal contracts. So we've had some, some CIP funding. Uh, to date, we haven't used it for tree removals, but we have for stump removals. So th that's where we are now. Do we have, don't we have a certain number that we're saving or we're attempting to save? Very few. Um, and the reason being, it's something that you have to do annually or mm -hmm. bian biannually, every two years, whatever that proper mm -hmm. word is. But, um, and it's relatively expensive. So for a private homeowner or, or uh, someone who has sentimental reasons for wanting to keep a tree or if it's a landmark tree, we do have a few, but not a lot. I don't know if you, there was an article, and I don't remember if it's in the paper or in the city uh, leisure or uh, C uh, League of Cities magazine, but mm -hmm. somewhere, I thought one of the larger cities had made a decision they were going to save all their ash trees. Did you see that? I think that there, and I don't want to be quoted on it, but you know, one of the major Midwest cities is treating all of their trees. My understanding was they're going to treat them and then phase that they won't try to save all of them, but they're treating them instead of removing them all at once so that they'll be able to remove them more slowly. Um, but there are environmental concerns with the material that's used as well as the cost. So uh, the plan that we presented to you in a work session some years ago now mm -hmm. um, had that as an option, but that's not the option that we're, I mean, we're using it as a tool, but as a minimal part of our management. Right, thank you. Sure. Anything else? <clears throat> All in favor, vote by the sign of aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Yes. Uh, just a quick follow-up, uh, Pat Trailer, Chief Fire Services. A couple weeks ago in this forum, uh, Mr. Jones requested that uh, we run an item through uh, our IT department, which we hadn't. Uh, we did get bids for a tablet, and uh, so we did follow up on that uh, through uh, Medical Officer Hernandez, and surprisingly, we got a bid back from the same company that sent us a bid, and it was $300 cheaper for the tablet. So. Uh, I'm just giving you an update that uh, your comment did save us 300 bucks, and it was well received, and we'll continue to follow up on that. Great, nice job. Thank you. Um, I move that we pay the bills this week, which are three million six hundred and twenty-eight thousand three hundred and fifty-eight dollars and fifty-four cents, three comma six two eight comma three five eight point five four. Second. We have a motion and a second. Yeah. Any discussion? All in favor, vote by the sign of aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. I move that we adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. aye. Thank you for your time, gentlemen.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, welcome. We have a good crowd tonight to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Waterloo City Council on Monday, December 31st. Excuse me, December 21st, 2015. Uh, again, we have a good crowd tonight, and for all of you that may be watching us on our public access television, welcome to you also. Madam Clerk, would you start by reading the roll, please? Yes, Ms. Cole? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Schmidt? Here. Mr. Lynn? Mr. Morrissey? Here. Mr. Welper? Here. Mr. Hart? Here. Thank you very much. If you would all join me, please, in standing for just a moment of silent reflection and prayer. <laughs> Thank you very much. And also, if you would all join me in pledging allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Hart. I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda as proposed and also the minutes of December's 14th regular session. Second. Council, do you have any questions or comments regarding either tonight's agenda or the minutes of last week? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. First thing we're going to do is recognize somebody that uh, deserves to be recognized. Craig, come on up, would you please? Greg Hensman, and if you'd like to bring uh, family members, uh, whoever's with you, if you'd like to bring them, please just uh, just come on up. Come through the door over here. Just push it and walk on up. All the way up. All the way up. <laughs> Not just partially. We're gonna just stand right here. If you want, give us a seat. Give us a seat. Guys, come on over here and just get next to your dad. What's your name? Will. Will. Hi, Holly. Holly, nice to meet you guys. Uh, you know, we do this, uh, uh, for those of you that come regularly or, or watch on our television regularly, uh, I'll, I'll, I'm just going to bore you a little bit by explaining what we're doing tonight. When I first took office, I started a program to recognize our city employees. Uh, we started a little gung-ho program that, uh, that, that I, uh, I particularly wanted to make sure that the people that really do the work in the city, they're out there every single day and they show up every day, get recognized for the good job that they do. Uh, you know, we set up here, we think we run the city, but we don't. You know, it's you guys that go to work every day and, and, and make the city work. So I started a program that uh, we recognize somebody every month for a team member of the month. And then at the end of the year, for the last six years, we've recognized somebody at the end of the year as team member of the year. And uh, I don't have anything to do with picking it. Those are picked by your peers and the nominating committee from the team member program. So uh, <laughs> this year, Craig Ensman with the traffic department is our team member of the year. And I, I wish I could have a bunch of his peers stand up and give this recognition because uh, I, I, from what I understand, Craig is, is just a super employee, fun employee. And the pictures that went around after his, <coughs> I, I haven't seen any pictures from the team member of the year award, Craig. I, are there some coming? Uh, there might be. <laughs> 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 We're thinking about glamour shopping. Glamour shopping. <laughs> I think you can tell what kind of an employee Craig is. <laughs> uh, Craig, um, one of the most important things about this has been to me is that you don't have to be, uh, you know, Superman. You don't have to jump tall buildings or step in front of speeding trains. You just have to be a good employee that gets a wallet along well with the people that he works with and you show up every day, you have a smile on your face and you contribute in a positive way to the team. And Craig does that in spades. So I'm gonna read uh, his nomination when he got team member of the month, why he was team member of the month. Uh, it, it says, you are the go-to person when traffic operation employees have computer related problems out in the field. Your knowledge is beneficial to the city when problems arise with specialty traffic equipment, you spend the needed time to work through issues, thereby saving the city costly services calls from equipment providers. Keeping public safety in mind, you come into work early, many days starting at 3 or 4 a.m. You turn in for overtime at that when you do that. Are you costing the city money? Or are, are we okay? No, are, are we okay on that? Yeah. Uh, uh, I'll defer that for later. Okay. <laughs> In order to work around peak traffic volume times for the yearly traffic signal, 
conflict monitor testing. You have taken on this task with a self-guided attitude and willingness to make sure the job is done correctly and safely. You go out of your way to help anyone that needs a hand. You care about your job, your department, and the citizens of Waterloo, and you are always ready with a smile to help no matter what the job is. Craig, for team member of the year, you also get a certificate. And this says team member of the year. This certificate is awarded to Craig Hintzman in recognition of demonstrating performance and effort which exemplifies a standard of excellence and dedication within the city workforce in the <coughs> delivery of services to our customers, the citizens, and fellow team members. You get that. Okay, there's that. There's your nomination. I already have a copy of that. You also get a gift certificate this time. The team members of the month get 25 bucks. Uh, to go out and do whatever with. The team member of the year gets a $100 gift certificate. Wow, there we go. So, you. so uh, uh, I, you know, you can do whatever you want to that, but I'm, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and you also get a plaque, uh, uh, Craig. Team member of the year, 2015. Presented to Craig Hensman for excellence and dedication within the city workforce and the delivery of services to our customers, the citizens, and fellow team members. So, Craig, that's yours also. Wow, thank okay, you. you're welcome. Would you like to say a couple of words? No, I'm just. Uh, well, you yes, can't, if yes. you are, you got to talk into the mic. You, you got and you got to talk right into it. Don't, don't be bashful. That's right. I was told not to go past seven thirty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just thank you so much. Uh, I'm proud to be a member of the Waterloo team, and uh, also be recognized by you. Thank you for taking the time to do that. Um, it makes a difference to us. Uh, these. Uh, you may consider it small, but for me, it's a big thing. Good. Thank Good. you. Greg, thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you, guys. Merry Christmas. And Craig and family, as I always tell our, our, our visitors, uh, you're welcome to stay if you'd like. And, and get a little dose of, uh, of uh, uh, city government. Uh, if you don't, uh, you're more than welcome to leave, and you're not going to offend anybody. So uh, <laughs> your choice, OK? <laughs> you bet. All right, uh, fun stuff. And, and I've gotten to know Craig a little bit, and uh, he's just one of those guys that you love to have in your department. He's just, as you can tell, he's just fun. He's always fun, always positive, and what a great employee. OK, Mr. we Mayor. got other work to do here. Mr. Mayor. I move, I move that we receive and place on file and approve the consent agenda items 1A through uh, B5. Also with the approval of the consent agenda, I move that we make our bills payment, which we were at for the last time by this current finance chair. The bills for the last time are $3,628,358.54. Three comma six two eight comma three five eight point five four. Second. Council, do you have any questions or comments regarding the consent agenda, Mr. Mayor? Mr. Morrissey. Yes. Um, yeah, regarding one A uh, uh, ten and eleven on the consent agenda, uh, specifically one eleven, I guess more so than ten. Uh, there are some properties in there. Uh, specifically 219 new or not new 219 Sumner Street which does have uh, from the last meeting with Historical Preservation Commission last Tuesday historical significance for the triangle area which hopefully at some point will be a designated historic district in Waterloo and um, I talked to Mr. Jones just before the meeting about removing that and he wants he if, if Rudy could get up and speak to that, I'd appreciate that. What we could do to try to get that taken off at some point in time. Okay, well, you realize that we're just setting the date of hearing tonight. So yes. you have ample time if you'd like to yes. uh, to approach council to, to do that. But, yes, I okay. understand. And we're, and we're just setting the date of hearing for the removal of asbestos, actually. Well, no, 11 is a demolition. demolition. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Rudy? Rudy Jones, Community Development Director. Uh, these are specifically 657A properties that uh, we took the initiative to begin the asbestos removal and demolition process. And as I indicated to Chris Western, who is, I guess, more or less uh, the one who gets those through the legal department, we will be able to uh, pull those off the list. As I indicated, I didn't want to stop the process or the project, so we at least would still be able to address 
the ones that would be okay to demolish. Thanks, Rudy. Appreciate it. So, uh, are you okay with that, Mr. Morrison? Yes, uh, uh, okay, Mayor. Well. I believe that Terry Stevens is here. She wanted to speak to this as well. Okay. <clears throat> I, 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 again, I, I want to, you know, admonish or not admonish. That's not the right words. But we're not doing anything tonight. But setting the date of hearing. So, if you, if you want to pull it off, I mean, there will be ample time to have conversation. But Terry, go ahead. I hope we don't need any more conversations after this. Okay. My name is Terry Stevens. I'm here to request that the City Council forego any further demolition of 219 Sumner Street specifically and all other properties located within the Triangle, which is located on the east side of Waterloo. The Triangle holds significant historical, cultural, and architectural significance which much, with much of its history connected to the railroad. Recently, the Waterloo Historic Preservation Commission voted to seek funding to preserve meaningful properties located in the Triangle. Although I do serve as a commissioner, I am here today as a taxpaying citizen. I grew up and still reside on the east side. I clearly remember the vibrant community that once existed here. The two oldest black churches, Antioch and Payne AME, are in the Triangle. Two members of Local 46, the first integrated workers' union at Rath Packing House, lived in the Triangle. And many black-owned businesses and cultural establishments, Roth's Grocery Store, White Rose Cleaners, Miss Effie's, and the Knights of Pythias flourished in the Triangle. Since the advent of urban renewal, the east side of Waterloo has undergone continuous destruction of not only buildings of significance, but also the history and culture attached to those buildings. Much like the war zones of Iraq, Afghanistan, and other war-torn countries, the east side of Waterloo has increasingly become patches of empty concrete lots. This request is just because, as most of us know, the east side of Waterloo is treated as a stepchild. The last master plan for the city was implemented and carried out and the only thing on the east side included was the Blacks Building. It is time that the same consideration that is given to the west side of this city be given to the east side of this city. We pay taxes too. I think this is a perfect place to begin. And as Dale Carnegie said, if you develop success from failures, discouragement and failure are two of the surest stepping stones to success. Let's start succeeding on the east side of Waterloo. Thank you, Terry. All right. Uh, with that in mind, uh, Mr. Morrissey, I'm assuming that you will follow up with the appropriate uh, city staff and, and et cetera to uh, address this issue. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I've totally lost my place. Have, have we done anything yet? We need to do a roll call. Okay. We've got a motion, uh, and, a we've got a motion and a second on the consent agenda. Could uh, you do a roll call, please, Madam Clerk? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Walper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Thank you. Okay, very good. We have some people to recognize tonight uh, from the consent agenda. Uh, first, I'm going to recognize two that I don't believe are here, Brian Uthie and Tim Steimel. Are either Brian or Tim here? I don't believe they are. Uh, Brian and Tim both are uh, members of our street department, and they have both been uh, uh, appointed to operator twos in our street department, so that's a very positive thing. And just for a little uh, history, Brian Uthi is, is one of the fellows that lost his job in the, in the traffic, uh, uh, in the parking issue when Republic Parking came. And, no, and there was, or, oh, I'm sorry, it's Tim. Okay, well, it's Tim Steinel that lost his position, and he's now getting one back with the city. So we're very pleased to be able to talk about that. Okay, no, not right now. It wouldn't. Um, but you'll there's, get a there's several appointments also uh, that we have to talk about to recognize tonight. Uh, Dick Hastings, uh, if you're here, Dick, uh, just stand up, would you please? Uh, Richard Hastings, uh, Marcia Corbett, Don Tickner, Ron McMahon, Sherm Lundy are all uh, members of the Memorial Hall Commission, one of our important buildings downtown. They are all being reappointed to terms on our uh, Memorial Hall Commission. Marissa Van Dorn, I don't think Marissa's here either. Marissa Van Dorn has been uh, reappointed to a, a position on the Cultural and Arts Board. Eric Donat and uh, Cheryl Ferries, are, and I don't see either one of them here tonight, have been reappointed to 
uh, positions on our Human Rights Commission. So to all of those folks, we appreciate the time and the effort that citizens uh, give to us and their talents to step up and to serve on our appointments. So anyway, uh, congratulations to all of them. And that is passed, and we'll do public hearings now. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Item number two is a motion to receive and file proof of publication of notice of public hearing, and that's for the exchange agreement and assignment of real estate contract between the City of Waterloo and l and Farms Limited for the acquisition of 11.98 acres of land in Blackhawk County for the sum of $403,700 in exchange for property in the San Marnin TIF District. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries and the hearing is now open. Madam Clerk, do we have any written objections to item number two? There were none. If there's anyone in the audience that would like to speak either for or against item number two, please come to the microphone, give us your name and address, and uh, please uh, limit your comments to three minutes. David Dreyer, 3145 West 4th Street. Again, we're talking about some more TIF money. Um, we've al always been asking about whether there was any way to release any TIF money to relieve a tax burden on the citizens. Um, I guess every minute we find more and more money is putting into the TIF in different districts. Uh, I, I see this in the paper that uh, property taxes paid in the San Martin tax, tax increment finance district will be used to pay for the, for the property. Uh, I guess one of my questions would be, is there enough money to acquire this land and uh, develop it? Yes. Uh, my other question about that would be that I always, when I, when I tried to put my property up for sale for a uh, high V convenience store on 4th uh, in Ainsboro, it was, oh, there, that's going to increase the traffic too bad on, on that street. Yeah, we went ahead and we did the money for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. We gave to to uh, uh, VGM. Got a dollar back for it. That increases the traffic on Fourth and Hainesboro. Now we're developing and continuing to develop south of, of Interstate Twenty. All that traffic is not going to come down Twenty. It's going to come up Hainesboro. It's going to come up all the different streets around there and come up Ainsboro. So if we continue to do this stuff and we don't have the money, then we're looking at bonding again, aren't we? And that bonding money is not being paid totally back by TIF as far as I would feel. Somewhere along the line, us as the taxpayers are making up that money. Uh, is there enough money in there? Yes. Okay. So that over overshadows the seven hundred fifty thousand dollars we're going to get back at how many years down the road from VGM? We're not talking about VGM. We're talking about L and H Farms and buying some property. From I know Mr. what we're Dry. talking about, but we're okay, talking we're, about TIF money, okay. Mr. Clark. Yes, sir. And I told you there's enough money that, in, the, in the TIF fund, Mr. Dreyer. Okay, but how fast are we getting paid back? I don't know. Uh, would you do that with your money? Yes. I don't think so. Thank you. Uh, William Smith here. See, I was re reading this article also about that L and H Farms and TIF money. Uh, who is L and H Farms? Uh, are they at Waterloo area, or who? Anybody know who L and H Farms is? <laughs> Come on, Buck, give me an answer. Well, Mr. Smith, do you think we'd be dealing with somebody we didn't know who they were for crying out loud? No, but I was just saying this is TIF money going into this. Yeah, this and they talk about, about the corridor of 20. This is about the fourth or fifth transaction, sixth, tra sixth transition we've done with l &H Farms. That's uh, Noah, why don't you just go ahead and, and give it's us a good uh, picture and all in the paper here. We'll make give us sure. another uh, explanation of what we're doing here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. And I don't mean to make light of it, but I mean the insinuation that we're doing business with somebody we don't know is a little. <coughs> no, overrated. it's not an insinuation. I'm talking about taxpayer money. All right. And we talk about the 20 corridor, Highway 20 corridor. What about the 63 corridor? Okay, okay. Uh, Mr. Smith, you gave us your name, but what's your address, please, for the record? Just 2260 Ashland Avenue. Thank you very much, sir. We're off the uh, Donald Street out there. Okay. We're out in what we call the hood. Yep. You know? Thanks. <laughs> no. What What's this transaction, please? Noel Anderson, Community Planning Development Director. 
Back in 2010, the city of Waterloo entered into an eight-year agreement with l &H Farms, who are the property owners of the majority of land um, located at the southeast corner of Ainsboro and Highway 20. l &H Farms is a well-established and long-standing uh, farm family in the Waterloo area. Um, this was set up as an option and exchange agreement, so what they are doing is they go out and they buy additional land to continue their business of farming um, in the Blackhawk County area. They buy land in the county. In exchange for that, we end up buying land or getting land from them near the Ainsboro 20 interchange, which we believe is prime development land for trying to draw large businesses here. A couple of years back, uh, the City of Waterloo amended that agreement to make it an 11-year total agreement for a total of 181.7 acres under option. Um, that we're this current transaction will put us at 86.05 acres. We're about halfway there. We're at about five and a half years through the agreement, so we're right on time. Um, we are using TIF cash. We are not bonding for this. The TIF is generating cash from the development in there. Uh, while Mr. Dreyer believes VGM only gave us a dollar, they actually gave us about an $18 million project out there, and they'll bring us 250 to 300 new employees to the Waterloo area. So there's a lot of return on this that we capture and figure into our investments. and. Uh, that's how we're moving ahead on this. Thanks, Noel. Well, we're just asking, you know, this tip comes up quite often. I understand it's a good deal, and I hope that Logan Plaza area would be get developed through tip, and some of that money would come to the north instead of always going south. That's our hopes, if too. We've had failures of businesses supposed to come out there, like Menards, and that didn't happen. I don't know what happened there. They bought the land, and we can't get developed on the east side. I don't understand why everything keeps going south and west and I'm, we're just asking as taxpayers how are we going to get that developed and because i'm up there blowing my horn i'd like to thank the police department for the job they're doing because we had a break-in in our neighborhood and never made the paper so send more cops out that way thank you thanks mr smith appreciate it I believe I heard uh, Jim Chapman, 224 Birch. I heard, uh, I think I heard Noel said they're going to give us like $18 million back in jobs and so on and so forth. Can he guarantee that all those people are going to live in Waterloo, spend money in Waterloo, and stay in Waterloo? I don't think so. Thanks, Jim. Is there anyone else? Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to close the hearing and receive and file oral comments. Second. Council, do you have any uh, comments or questions regarding this item? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to adopt a resolution approving the exchange agreement and assignment of real estate contract between the City of Waterloo and l &H Farms Limited for the acquisition of 11.98 acres of land in Blackhawk County for the sum of $403,700 in exchange for property in the San Martin Tip District. Second. Madam Clerk, that's a roll call vote, please. Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Wilford? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Mayor, I'd like to adopt a res resolution approving a memorandum of agreement with l &H Farms Limited to prorate real estate taxes for the sale and purchase of the real estate to December 23rd, 2015. Second. Madam Clerk, please. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Thank you. Very good. The motion carries. Item number three, please. Mr. Mr. Morrissey? I'd like to make a motion to receive and file proof of publication notice of public hearing on a request by Metal Building Solutions for a site plan amendment in the B-P Business Park District to allow for the construction of five new commercial buildings totaling 23,900 23, square feet on property generally located near the intersection of Highway 63 and Greyhound Drive, east of 3250 Greyhound Drive. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. I'm sorry? Yeah, motion carries. Uh, hearing is now open. Madam Clerk, did we have any written objections on file? No, there were none. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to speak either for or against item number three? Second time. Mr. Mayor. Mr. I'd Morrissey. I'd like to make a motion to close the hearing and... Close the hearing. Accept the uh, recommendation of approval yeah. planning, program, programming, and zoning commission. Second. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Morrissey. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Council, do you have any questions or comments? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, is there a certain way that these 
buildings have to, to look, or are they, I mean, they're metal buildings, but is it going to match what's already out there somewhat? No. <coughs> Noel Anderson, Community Planning Development Director. Uh, this should go through the Planning Commission, um, and they looked at the uh, design and thought it was a, appropriate for, for the area that's going in out there. There's actually a, a mesh of uh, metal and some other um, EFIS system and, and some brick materials in the, the uh, <coughs> exterior facade of the buildings. We think it looks very appropriate for the area. Um, I would note, uh, if we could, to suspend the rules, they are looking to try and get under construction right away under this one, um, site plan amendment. Okay. Are there further comments? Or questions? Madam Clerk, it's a roll call vote, please. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Thank Very you. good. Motion Mr. carries. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion to receive file, consider and pass for the first time in ordinance amending ordinance number 5079 as amended by City of Waterloo. Zoning ordinance by amending the official zoning map referred to in section 10-4-4 approving a site plan amendment on certain properties. Second. Madam Clerk? Mr. Wilper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Motion uh, carries. Mr. Mayor? Yes, sir. I'd like to make a motion to suspend the rules. Second. Madam Clerk, please. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Wilper? Yes. Very good. Thank you, uh, Council, for that. Uh, they are anxious to get started. Uh, Go Mr. ahead, Mayor. Mr. Morrissey. I'd like to make a motion to consider and pass for the second and third times and adopt the ordinance. Second. Madam Clerk, that's a roll call vote also, please. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. I get the motion carries. Item number four, please. I cancel. Item number four, please. It was canceled. Canceled. Yes. Right under operations. It was canceled. There's no hearing for force. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, let's do resolutions five, six, and seven, please. Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. That's okay. I move we adopt a resolution approving acceptance of community foundation grant in the amount of $7,171 for the Home Park Boulevard Tree Replacement Program and authorize Mayor City Clerk to sign all necessary documents. Six is another resolution approving a temporary easement agreement with Daryl and Julie Baird for $110.94 at 1441 East Shawless Road in relation to the East Shawless Road Recreational Trail Extension from Highway 21 eastward to Isle of Capri Boulevard. Number seven is a resolution approving the dedication of a sanitary sewer easement with BCS Properties LLC adjacent to 1850 West Ridgeway Avenue to allow for the construction, maintenance, repair, removal, or replacement of a sanitary sewer. Second. Council, do you have any questions regarding five, six, or seven? No. Madam Clerk, those are roll call votes, please. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Very good. The motions carry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have to read number nine. That was included in the uh, ordinance chain, or the ordinance that we just did. If someone would do eight, ten, and eleven, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Welper. Number eight is a resolution approving the dedication of a sanitary sewer easement with GAC Real Estate LLC adjacent to 1850 West Ridgeway Avenue for the construction, maintenance, repair, and removal of replacement of the sanitary sewer. Number 10 is a resolution approving the fiscal year 2016 economic development grant to Greater Cedar Valley Alliance for work towards economic development in the amount of $28,500 with $56,500 in potential incentive funds and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute said document. Number 11 is a motion approving a change order number two for a net decrease of $66,643.88 for the fiscal year 2016 sidewalk re Sidewalk Assessment Program, Zone 5, contract number 892, and authorize the mayor and city clerk to execute said document. Second. Thank you, Mr. Welper. Council, do you have any questions regarding 810 or 11? 810 or 11? Madam Clerk, those are roll call votes, please. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you. We could do uh, 12, 13, and 14, please. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Hart. Move to adopt a resolution approving completion of project and recommendation of acceptance for work for work performed by 
Midwest Concrete Inc. of Piasta, Iowa at a total cost of $214,893.61 for the FY 2016 Sidewalk Repair Assessment Program, Zone 5, Contract Number 892. 13. I move to adopt a resolution approving documents and adopt and levy the final schedule of assessments in conjunction with the FY 2016 Sidewalk Repair Assessment Program, Zone 5, Contract Number 892. And 14, I move to adopt a resolution approving uh, professional services agreement with AECOM Technical Services for project design services associated with the FAA funded projects for FY 2016 at Waterloo Regional Airport in the amount of $130,500 and approve the mayor to execute said document. Second. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Council, do you have any questions regarding 12, 13, or 14? Madam Clerk, those are roll call votes also. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Very good. Thank you. Could someone finish them out and take the last four? Mr. Mayor? Ms. Cole? 15 is a resolution approving a PSA with AECOM Technical Services for Project Design Services associated with the FY 2016 IDOT funded projects at Waterloo Regional Airport in the amount of $16,900 and approve and authorize the mayor to approve said, execute said document. 16 is a resolution approving acceptance of a State Farm Arson Dog Scholarship for up to $25,000. 17 is a resolution authorizing Mid-America Energy to install an equivalent LED to a 100 watt HPS streetlight on a wood pole on the east side of the 500 block of Derbyshire Road. And 18 is a resolution supporting the application by Blackhawk Contracting and Development Company for the Iowa Workforce Housing Tax Incentives Program to construct four new single-family homes in Waterloo located on Madison Street and Monroe Street. Second. Very good. Thank you, uh, Ms. Cole. Council, do you have any questions regarding 15, 16, 17, or 18? Those four. Madam Clerk, please. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morris? Yes. Very good. The motion carries. Uh, we have an ordinance, please. Number 19. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Schmidt? Number 19 is a motion to receive, file, consider, and pass for the first time an ordinance amending the 2008 traffic code by amending section 551, parking prohibited at all times on certain streets by adding 268A Mockingbird Lane, west side of the 1400 block. 4,100 block. 4,100 block. Thank you. Very good. Second. Council, do you have any questions or comments? Madam Clerk. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Motion carries. Mr. Mayor, I make a motion to suspend the rules. Second. Madam Clerk? Ms. Cole? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Okay. Good. The motion carries. Mr. Mayor, make a motion to consider and pass for the second and third times and adopt the ordinance. Second. Madam Clerk, please. Mr. Jones? Yes. Mr. Schmidt? Yes. Mr. Morrissey? Yes. Mr. Welper? Yes. Mr. Hart? Yes. Ms. Cole? Yes. Very good. The motion carries. Item number 20, please. Mr. Mayor. Ms. Cole? I move we receive the City of Waterloo Comprehensive Annual Financial Report for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2015 and place it on file. Second. second. Council, do you have any questions? Comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of our regularly scheduled business tonight. Uh, it's time for oral presentations. Uh, if there's anyone in the audience that would like to speak to Mayor Council, now is the time to do so. Please, please come to the council or come to the podium. Give us your name and address and limit your comments to three minutes, please. I'm Renee Carson, Common Ground Neighborhood Association. My address is 1108 Vine Street here in Waterloo. And I'm coming tonight as a concerned citizen. As something that happened to me Saturday. And I felt very disrespectful, very threatened. And I don't want it to happen to anybody else. I was pulled over because the police said I ran a red light here. And if I'd have ran that red light where he said I ran it, I don't think I'd be standing here today because it was on the highway of Washington and everybody knows how those cars come down through there. And 
He was very berating. He was very rude by how he talked to me and had my grandkids very upset. And that's what pissed me off, was how he talked to me. Now we're talking about bridging the gap between the police and the citizens. Well, that works both ways. And we need to be talked to right. Because then we wonder why our young kids don't respect the police. And when they see how the police treat you, that's one of the reasons why. And I don't want to berate the police department. I think they're doing a fantastic job. But that was just out of order. And I did not get his badge number nor his name because I was afraid. And I felt very threatened because if I'd have asked him for that, I feel that it would have been a confrontation. And either I'd have went to jail or my grandkids, you know, because my grandkids was in that car with me. And what he said to me was, well, if I wasn't on my way on a call, I'll pull you over and arrest you. You know, he wasn't even in the police car. It was an unmarked car. I didn't know who he was. And he didn't, you know, like a police would pull behind you if you did something. He pulled up on the side of me when I turned the corner because I saw the light, so I was getting out the way thinking. And I said, well, what did I do? Well, you ran that red light. And because I questioned him, he was going to give me a ticket because I questioned him. I said, do I have a right to ask you what I did? And, he, and I told him, if, I, if you felt that I ran the red light, then I'm sorry. Well, if you're going to get smart, man, I'm going to give you a ticket. And I don't think we should be, have to be talked to like that. And have my grandkids upset and scared because they think Granny going to jail. And I just won't, I don't want this to happen to anybody else. Because there's etiquette. There's a way to talk to people. And I was going to get a ticket because I questioned him. And he was on his way to a call around the corner to a funeral procession. And I'm saying, now he going to tell me he going to give me a ticket for running the red light and he do a U-turn to get in the session. Now, that don't make any sense to me. Okay, Ms. Carson, thank you for that story. And we certainly don't uh, condone or, 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 or anything else, uh, activity like that. Have you spoken to Director Trelka yet? Uh, about this no, issue. No, I, I haven't, but I will okay. be down yeah, to talk yeah, to Yeah, because what, what I want, either tonight after the meeting or tomorrow, if you come down and, and meet with Director Trelka, give, we don't need his, his name and badge number. We can find that out. So we'll just need the, some of the information, the parameters of when, when you were stopped and what the location was. We can find all that out. Most of the time, these traffic stops are on uh, recorded and are, there's a record of them. So we would uh, very, uh, very much want to know uh, uh, what the whole circumstances where the stop was, and if that if you were treated that way, uh, trust me, we don't want that to happen either. So thank you for bringing it to our attention. All right. Good Thanks, Ms. Carson. Okay. Uh, is there someone else, please? Bruce. Bruce, can you? I mean, Dan, can you get Bruce the microphone, please? Thank you. Good evening. Hi, Good evening, Bruce. Bruce. Kazer, 514 East 2nd Street, Waterloo. I'm. Um, just want to recognize the life's better off right now because of this this council under Mary Buck Clark's direction. And I want to say thank you. I know Buck, you're not going to be gone. You won't be forgotten. You'll be hanging around. Thank you. You, you know me well, Bruce. Thank you for that. Yeah. <laughs> Happy retirement. Yeah. Yeah. Again. Okay. Bruce, thank you. And as I've said many times to you, God bless you for, for being here and for participating and partaking in city government and everything. So thank you very much for your, your thank issue. Thank you for allowing me to speak my piece. You bet. And tolerate with me. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Now, this time I'm Willie Smith. Okay. Same as William. But I'd like to let you know I did 30 years of military service. Army, and I might have ruffled your feathers a little bit there, Mayor. I'm sorry about that, but I was sincere about the chief over here. Uh, I know we're trying to unify this city with the south side, and west side, east side, north side, and it's going to take a family to do that. And there's a lot of knowledge sitting right up there, and I know you folks, you hammered every day, and you're involved, Noel's involved with planning and zoning. We're trying to build this city and make it more vibrant. Waterloo needs to grow, and 
if we grow, we'll get more cops, and the chief here will be happy. But, uh, you know, we have 120 cops now, I don't know, don't we, chief? And we gotta, we gotta roll around this city. I see no disre disrespect to no policemen, but I see cop cars sitting around that I wish they would have been in my area last week. Like I say, one of our neighbors got broke into his house, and we're all getting vigilant. Uh, I know he's talked about having a family coming together, the city helping the police department, sheriff department, and all of the city, and that includes the whole city. We don't want to all start packing guns, but you know, I know we're, we're legal, some of us are legal, and we'd hate to hurt anybody, but you got to protect your families. So I'd hope that we be a little more vigilant on the citizen side and the police side, and I thank you for your time. Thanks, Mr. Smith. Appreciate it very much. Mr. Mayor, hi. Good morning, or good evening. Yes, sir. Okay, Doctor, Ted how are you? Uh, good. Ted Lederman, 1758 Pinehurst Lane, Waterloo, Iowa. And I just wanted to thank you as mayor and the city council for the fine work uh, you've done uh, the past few years to keep us safe and try to keep us happy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Lederman. I appreciate it. David Dreyer, 3145 West 4th Street. Uh, I believe I heard a while ago that Noel said that uh, VGM was bringing two to 300 jobs to the city, and I think it was sold to us before on the fact that VGM was moving three to 400 jobs, or two to 300 jobs from the crossroads to VGM to bring them in-house. I guess I'd like to have a clarification on that. No, please. They're, they're oh, no. No Anderson Community Planning and Development Director. I believe there was an article in the Courier that talked about the relocation of jobs at VGM. They were actually temporarily leasing space in the Tower Park building um, because they were growing so fast that they didn't have the building space. And so this new building will accommodate them to be able to move the, the employees that they had in the temporary leased area of Tower Park into an actual VGM building. Plus it has the capacity for another 250, 300 employees. They are not moving employees from the Crossroads area, which is a different uh, corporation of BGM over there. Okay, but they are not adding two to 300 employees like this TIF mandate type of thing says that we're supposed to bring new businesses to town and, and add employees to add to the tax base? 74,000 square foot professional office building they are building will have the ability to hold another 200 to fit 250 to 300 employees. And those employees are coming on staff soon. They will be hiring to relieve them. our tax burden. They will be hiring them as they see fit. We're not in charge, Mr. Dreyer, of, of how or when VGM hires, who they hire, or how many they hire. When I mean, they're building a new addition to their building for crying out loud. They're one of the most successful companies in our city. Uh, you know, I understand we should that, be thanking them instead of questioning their motives. I understand that, Holy Mr. Clark, man. but at the same time, okay. this TIF stuff that you keep shoving down our we're, throat we're is supposed to... We're shoving it down your throat, Mr. We're not shoving it down your throat. It's, it's, it's helping this city immeasurably, Mr. Dreyer, for but us to be But it's not helping my taxes. Officer, okay. And that's what part of TIF is supposed to do. Okay. I'm sorry. I, part I of the Isle of Capri is supposed to do. For a minute. Sorry. Okay. I, I, Is it we'll not? do everything we can, and I'm sure what, Mr. Hart's going to do it. Wasn't that the mandate of tax, uh, the TIF district, and, okay. and the money we were supposed to get from, from the Alec Capri was supposed to relieve taxes? And my taxes, like I said last meeting, went up $1,632 in five years. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you for your help. Forest Dillavu, 1725 Huntington Road, Waterloo, Iowa. We talked about pulling a house off the 657A destruction list that we had. Uh, 
some time ago there was another house on third street house of hope wanted that house and asked for it begged for it and finally gave up and walked away that house on third street i believe today is sitting exactly was it as it was a year ago also uh, the dunsmore house several years ago some of the city council thought we needed that as a city we had a buyer that wanted to buy it <clears throat> and uh, we turned the buyer down and we bought the dunsmore house Today, it sits as it did that day that we agreed not to sell it. 657A houses, if they're purchased by an individual or a corporation, they have to basically post a bond and they have to do a performance on those 657A homes. They have to make movement within so much time. Mm -hmm. And I know the city works with them. If they're working on it, they can get an extension, which is wonderful. It's wonderful to save those places. But I think we need to do something like posting a bond on these other houses if they're ugly enough to get on the list, it takes years to get them on the list. The neighbors want them down and to set for a year. Uh, <clears throat> the Third Street house set there for a year. The Dunsmore house set there for probably five or six years. We're not doing due diligence on the city side like we do with a citizen or corporation buying those 657A homes. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Dillard. I, I agree with you tonight. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to address the mayor or council tonight? Council, do you have any closing comments? Mr. Mayor. Mr. Morrissey? I'd just like to say thank you to you and to Carolyn Cole for um, your friendship with uh, me and your uh, accessibility uh, to um, issues that I uh, was ignorant of and I at least feel like I became somewhat uh, cognizant of what the uh, main concerns were and the knowledge that you gave to me is was very important so thank you very much both of you and then uh, you're, you're welcome it's sorry to see you go as a ward for um a council person but we'll see you in the mayor's chair there you go <laughs> well and also uh i also want to thank you for your service as well to you and carolyn and for putting up with pat uh, <laughs> over these years as well <laughs> but uh it, it's not an easy job um, but if you're willing to step in that chair and do the best that you believe that you can do, um, I have to compliment you for that. So thank you. Thank you for the thank last you, several Hart. years. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Anybody else from the council? Oh, Mr. All right, Mr. Uh, no, Willie, I'm sorry. What, it, the, the rules on the front page, you can only speak once. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, I'd just like to wish everybody in the room and everybody home watching a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Anybody else? Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. I, I do have to say thank you to both you and Carolyn. Um, I guess I've served with you longer than I have anybody else. Um, you didn't always vote the right way, but uh, <laughs> but I I think you uh, I think you agreed with me most of the time. So it's just maybe that one percent that you were uh, I, I think on I, the wrong I track. I just about got you converted to the deed side. Of the, I don't think that'll happen there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Again, th thank you to both of you. You're welcome. It's been a You're welcome. Day. Enjoy yeah. your retirement. And I, I tell you, uh, you know, if, is everybody through? Because I'd like to have the last word. Yeah. Okay. You. Uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> uh, I, Ron's right. Uh, I mean, Ron and I have served together. We served four years on the council mm -hmm. before the mayor's job. And, uh, uh, you know, I, I think what your and my relationship was, though, Ron, was the kind of relationships that are meant to have, is that you can have spirited sometimes debate, mm -hmm. you know, and you can disagree. Uh, and then you can vote on something, and when the vote is taken, and whoever won, you or I, we're talking about back when we were on council, we became friends at the end of the day. And we would go somewhere and have an adult beverage, or we would go out together or something, but it never went past that debate. That, we seem to have lost that ability to not have things be personal, which is incredibly unfortunate. And you and I, uh, I consider us very good friends, and I think we are, so I wish we could get that back. And ladies and gentlemen, just uh, it, it's the last meeting. It's the last meeting for me. It's the last meeting of the year. And I have a little bit of a statement here. I wasn't going to do this, but I, I, I decided that I was. So, uh, you know, I'm incredibly, incredibly humbled and honored to have had the privilege of serving uh, this great community as its mayor for the past six years. My list of thank yous, if I tried to thank everybody, would uh, just take the rest of the night, and nobody wants to be here that long. But I do have two that I need to, uh, to thank. I need to thank God, and I need to thank my wife, because I have bo asked both of them uh, for direction and for forgiveness many times. 
So as I close my final city council meeting and I reflect back, honestly, there are very few things I would do differently. Waterloo is a progressive city. We are not, as some would have you believe, on the verge of bankruptcy or insolvency. We have a very healthy, unrestricted fund balance and we pay our bills. We invest wisely and we spend wisely in order to move our city forward. I have been very fortunate that on most, almost every issue of economically significant value or investing in our truly, our most precious asset, our employees, not all, but a majority of the city council saw merit in that vision and voted accordingly. Waterloo citizens expect to have a vibrant, growing city. They expect to have quality of life amenities that provide entertainment and excitement. They expect to have adequately staffed departments that can get the job done professionally and in a timely manner. And they expect to have programs and services that meet their needs. They should expect those things. And over the past six years, and again, not all, but the majority of this council has agreed with me. And I believe we have delivered for our citizens and our employees, and we are moving Waterloo forward in a progressive manner. Waterloo has a tremendously bright future. We have pulled ourselves from the depths of the 1980s despair and are turning ourselves into a city with pride and a sense of accomplishment unmatched in recent years and completely deserved, by the way. I believe our biggest enemies is ourselves. To quote Spiro Agnew, <laughs> or at least partially quote him, in Waterloo today, we have more than our fair share of nattering nabobs of negativism. They have formed their own 4-H club, the hopeless, hysterical, hypochondriacs of history. And they're a roadblock in our journey to a better, more progressive city. Particularly, my words only, those spineless, anonymous bloggers who spew their vitriol with no concern of exposure or fact-checking and whose posts are always wrong, always cruel, always vicious, and whose name will never appear on a nomination paper of any kind. I wish Mayor-elect Hart all the good luck in the world in his upcoming administration. He will have many challenges. I believe he's up to the task. And I truly hope that the majority of his council responds as the majority of you have for me and that you continue to move forward to further achieve the greatness this city is capable of experiencing. I'd like to end with a few words from Numbers, chapter 6, verses 24 and 26. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless you. Motion to adjourn. Amen. Second. I mean, second. Amen.